Greetings, this is Paul the Poke from paulthepoke.com and welcome to This Week in Prophecy. We got the following topics. Uh, This week we have a Russia and Ukraine operational update. Iran and Turkey, excuse me, Iran and Turkey. I know we've been scolded here in the United States based on our pronunciation of the Islamic Republic. We've been lectured on a global scale uh, at the World Cup on the pronunciation of Iran, 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 Iran. Um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Iran and Turkey are merging economically. We're going to talk a little bit about that, you know, falling in line with Ezekiel 38 and 39. We have an eruption on the big island of Hawaii, Mauna Loa, uh is uh oozing a little lava uh we're gonna talk something about dutch farmers they're under assault in the netherlands digital currencies in the news again i think this is going to be a continuing drumbeat get ready for this one uh, and also china uh but let's just jump right in again we're going to have an operational update on happenings in the ukraine Um, You know, effectively, Russia is struggling to make gains. Ukraine continues to push Russians out of their country. Now, unfortunately, Russia has devastated utility services within Ukraine. Missile strikes have rendered the majority of the country without electricity. Basic provisions, such as heat and water, are being hit very hard, and winter is beginning to set in. So uh, we will go... To our first tweet, and this is from the Institute for the Study of War. In their comments, Russian forces have made marginal gains around Bakhmut today, but Russian forces remain unlikely to have advanced at the tempo that the Russian sources claimed. Now, for you folks who want to take a deep dive into actual specifics of what's going on, in Ukraine with Russia and Ukraine. Click on this link right here and you will have a uh, pretty detailed report about what's taking place. I will go over uh, these particular slides. Assessed control of terrain in Ukraine and main Russian maneuver axes as of November 29. So this would have been yesterday as of yesterday afternoon. Uh, if you remember, this this was pretty significant there for a while, uh, but things have changed. The blue area is territory reclaimed by the Ukrainians. Um, this area here, Luhansk, Donetsk, and uh, the Crimea, uh, that's that was part of uh, Russian-controlled territory before February 24th. We're coming up on a year. That's kind of hard to believe, but this has been going on for close to a year. Well, about nine months. Um, And again, the Kherson area, that's been in the news recently. Uh, Ukraine has taken control of that. And then we have the area here in the pink with the red highlights. That's Russian controlled area. We have had some fighting over the last 24 hours. Uh, This is in around Kherson. I'm going to go through this. This essentially just shows territory recaptured in the blue uh, Ukrainian counter offenses and areas with the, the green circles. That's where the fighting has been over the past few days, possibly the last week. Um, skirmishes, war taking place currently. And more of this, this would be toward, I guess this would be the northern end, um, toward the northern part of Ukraine, where fighting continues. So, give you a little bit of an idea about what's going on there. I found this, this was an article from the Daily Mail, uh, how Russia plunged Ukraine into darkness. Satellite images show lights out across the country after Putin targeted energy stations and latest brutal barrage of missiles. Now, this was this was released about a week ago. Um, 
Strikes Wednesday disconnected three Ukrainian nuclear plants from the grid. Uh, country in darkness as temperatures fell below freezing. Satellite images, we're going to take a look at that on November 24th, and we're going to have a comparison of what things look like back in February 24th. So you're looking at nine months. This is what's happened over nine months um, of fighting and shows the targeted missile strikes um, in the Ukraine and what that what that has done. Whoops, let's get this over here. So this was at the beginning of, um, this was in February of 2022. Uh, whoops, it's not going to let me do that. Well, anyhow, Ukraine is in the center. And then we'll scroll over here, what we're looking at nine months later you can just see it's just not there's just not as much electrical activity ukraine kind of looks like the black sea lights are just out mostly all across ukraine there are a few in there kiev's got some lviv over here in the far west has some lights still but by and large a lot of darkness and i've, I've seen estimates the ma- all the major cities have been hit in some cases and 75 to 90 percent plus have been of the cities have been affected so um a lot a lot of damage um and this goes on to discuss the amount of losses here's a nice comparison um of what things look like nine months earlier versus what things look like now Shots from space, uh, satellite imagery from space. Um, And again, this is a daily mail. Links are provided for all of these. If you want to read the specifics, uh, I'm partial partial to daily mail. Uh, I think they do a very good job of trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. They got people on the ground taking photographs or they can get photographs from people who are there. Yeah. anecdotal comments from people in and around again daily mail link will be provided on this as well which takes us to we'll go back to this um you know and and this plays into ezekiel 38 verses 3 through 6 thus says to the lord god behold i am against you O gog chief prince of meshach tubal we're going to transition to turkey and iran Meshach and Tubal would indicate uh, what is modern day Turkey. Gomer, Beth, the Garma, arguably modern day Turkey. Uh, the land between the seas, uh, the Caucasus. So that'd be Armenia is part of that. Georgia, Azerbaijan, those particular areas. And Persia. And the thing that, that is, um, I want to point out. And this particular thing is you're starting to see Turkey and Iran, they're, they're merging together and they've discovered they both have something in common. Uh, they've declared war on quote terrorists as they see it. And those terrorists as they see it are the Kurds. Uh, you can go up here to this article from the Jerusalem post. Uh, Iran and Turkey share common interests in their targeting of the Kurds. And this is just an an analyst's analysis of the situation. Um, Seth Fransman is the author. Now, if you, again, if you want to read this article link is provided, click on it and this is what you'll see. And this gives some background from the uh, Iranian perspective. The Turkish perspective goes back, takes a look at history. How did we get here is kind of the idea But I think the best thing that makes the most sense with this article, in my mind, was the the last paragraph of the article. Turkey wants to be an energy hub partnering with Moscow, and Iran is selling drones to Moscow. Economics ties Turkey and Iran to Moscow. In this respect, they have a common policy, but not necessarily a policy that is solely anti-Kurdish. The end result is that the Kurds are victims and pay the price for the ankara Tehran partnership. And that's, that's pretty accurate. Um, 
and just to give you an idea where the, the Kurds are located, they're located here in northern Syria on the northern Syria, southern Turkey border. They're located here in northern Iraq, over toward northeast Iraq, and they're also located over here in the, in the areas of southeast Turkey, northwest Iran. And these people originally have their roots in, in Iran or ancient Persia. They got kicked out of there to these modern day co- countries and areas now. And we hear about this in, in the, in the news, the oil fields of Erbil, Kirkuk, uh, all of this area across here is rich in oil and gas. And we cannot have the Kurds controlling that to be making money off of that. So, you know, therefore that's why Turkey wants to come in, take these people out and also, also historically, there were, you know, Christian groups that settled in and around Mosul, uh, ancient Nineveh is, uh, you know, from a biblical standpoint on the Tigris river, that's the group of people you're, you're looking at. Um, but there's a lot of oil and gas in this area. And that's why, that's why Turkey wants to control it. That's why Iran wants to control it. And again, the idea is having a flow of gas, oil, energy <clears throat> from east to west into the Mediterranean to sell to Western Europe. Uh, Russia controls that by and large right now, with one little exception out here uh, <clears throat> off the coast of Israel. And that would be the, the Jewish people have a big pile of uh, natural gas sitting out here in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, but you just, just give you a scroll back and give you an idea of um, the lay of the land, if you will. Uh, again, if you want, want the link to that article, jerusalempost.com, Middle East article, Click on the link and take you straight to the article. Uh, we're going to read some verses here. We're going to we're going to transition just to let you know where we're going. Um, <clears throat> Mauna Loa, Hawaii's volcano, Mauna Loa, has started erupting. Um, and before we do that, let's just pull that up. Uh, yeah, provide a little context here, back this out. This is the big island of Hawaii. And again, context. All right, let's read some Bible verses. Nahum 1.5 Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. So the scope and scale of Nahum 1 verse 5 is the earth and all the people of the world in it, of the whole earth. It does not read... Mauna Loa quakes because of him. No, it does. But the point is the context. This is global is what's coming. And that's why I bring this up. And that's not to not to marginalize what's going on in Hawaii. But I do want, want everybody to see this is one volcano in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, it can make a big mess. Don't get me wrong. If this thing were to decide to really blow a lot of lava... And part of that island were to break off into the ocean. I mean, we'd have some real problems. I'm not. I'm. I'm I don't want to be flippant about that, but that that'd be a big deal. But big picture, this is one volcano. Uh, the world's largest active volcano erupted Monday morning on Hawaii's Big Island. And again, right on track. I feel good about this. The experts have come out. The United States Geological Survey says there's no risk. <laughs> no risk of magma fall, but an ash fall advisory is in place. 
Some residents on the Big Island have flocked to see the dangerous event, despite warnings from the governor. He doesn't want a whole bunch of people running to check this out. Uh, Mauna Loa last erupted in 84, brings an end to its longest ever quiet period. Others are cautiously watching for lava flows and have been told to be ready to evacuate if necessary. Now, the last eruption lasted more than two weeks, but did not flow into any of the island's communities. So everybody just relax. The experts are t- saying at this time there's no risk. So, and, and by and large, that's what they usually say. They're, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. Uh, again, Daily Mail, great pictures of this thing. Great stuff. Uh, We'll get into that in a second. Get back to the Bible verses. Psalm 97 verse 5, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. All of it. Not just a couple of volcanoes. All of it melts like wax. Huh. The mountains melt like wax, Psalm says. Interesting, isn't it? As we look at the pictures, look at the video. Micah 1, verse 4, And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. Huh. Get you some imagery here. Sounds pretty consistent with Scripture. Again, one mountain out in the middle of the of the Pacific in, you know, on the big Island of Hawaii, just one at some point, this will be a global phenomena is what, what the Bible's telling us here. I know that sounds over the top, but that is what it is. That's what it's saying. Isaiah 24, behold, the Lord lays the earth waste, devastates it, distorts its surface and scatters its inhabitants. Again, it's global in nature and scale. It's not an isolated event to an island or, uh, well, you think about most of the volcanoes that are taking place right now. Sicily uh, had the one off the coast of Africa, La Palma. Um, they're, they're, They're isolated small regional events. Bible talks about a time this will be global. It just says what it says. Um, Read that for yourself. Here's a little video, or not a video, but a a poster from the USGS. Talks about lava flow. Now, if you're in this red area in the South Kona region, lava flow from this region can reach populated areas in hours. Uh, Mauna Loa segment to the south and to the east can reach populated area in days to weeks up on the north shore northeast shore primarily well towards really toward the east end here lava flow can reach populated areas in weeks to months last time it took 280 days north kona on the northwest portion of the big island days to weeks so interesting stuff um cover this real quick after a 38 year snooze the world's largest active volcano mauna loa has come to life in hawaii and again fear not the experts state there's nothing to worry about don't worry about it this thing is huge 2035 square miles it is located mauna loa is 13,680 feet above sea level and more than 56,000 feet from its peak to its underwater base. 56,000 feet in height. And that's according to the USGS. Its volume is estimated to be some 18,000 cubic miles. And those, those, that data is from the USGS, and I got it from Google. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, too. Locals have indicated they are watching a sacred religious event. Altars have been constructed and sacrifices are being made near Mauna Loa. 
And again, if you want to read the details, dailymail.co.uk, Hawaii volcano eruption alert draws onlookers. And we will go back and take a look at this. I mean, some of this stuff, this is just great stuff, great video. Mostly copyright, it says, of tropical visions, but you can again see this at Daily Mail out of the UK. Um, rivers of lava. Lava flow hazard zones for Hawaii's Big Island. Um, very high. That's from the Kilauea volcano. It, in, in uh, Kalua Kona, I'm not even going to try to say that, but but I would argue this is just one big massive volcano. And the concern is, is that a sister volcano 20 miles away from Mauna Loa is starting to erupt as well. That's something that happened today. The Kilauea volcano has been in a constant state of eruption since 1983. Okay. Let's get back down here. I need to find the uh, religious experience where people are building altars to the gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Bible says that too in Exodus 20. Uh, I keep scrolling. There's the governor, David Ige, warned so-called lava junkies, taking the once-in-a-lifetime event more lightly to be wary while sightseeing dangers of such an eruption well yeah that's a big deal there's some common sense right there um where are we this is from satellite maxar technologies lava flows from uh, the volcano be ready in the event of a worst case scenario. I think that's pretty wise. I personally would not recommend going over there. It is the largest, most active volcano on the planet. Oh no, I don't feel the need to get that close to it. I'll watch it here from the internet. They have live things as well. Some of these pictures are beautiful, by the way. Kona Bay, island's west coast, not far from the volcano. That's a pretty shot. And, uh, from a grove of palm trees. That's also pretty. Got in a helicopter. Police chopper gives stunning time-lapse flyover of eruption. If you want to check that out. Now, apparently, this Kukio, less than 100 residents, billionaires hang out and hide there. I wonder if they're in the... They appear to be... Well, the lava flow... This looks like an old one. This is one. I don't... You'd have thought they'd have been a little smarter than that. I don't know. Okay. Scrolling down. We need this altar. I, that, this is one of the things that, that got my attention. People building altars to the gods. Uh, time for lava to reach populated areas in Hawaii varies. Again, we covered this earlier. 280 days to the east. Uh, hours, South Kona. <clears throat> Well, yeah, human interest story. That's interesting. Some of you folks may find that interesting. She thinks she's ready. This is Nicole Skilling of Captain Hook. She's got her car filled with goodies. Uh, she's got some dog food there for her dog. I don't know how long she thinks that's going to last her, but that that island goes. You're going to need more food than that. Uh, there we go. There's the altar. An altar is built on an old lava field in front of the erupting Mauna Loa Tuesday. Again, some people see this as a very sacred religious experience. Worshiping the gods at the volcano. A native Hawaiian offering is left on an old lava field. An offering to the gods. Anyway, lots of stuff here. An ashfall advisory is in effect. Local hazards include lava, flows, ash, and uh, kind of like a, a fog, if you will. 
probably not going to have a lot of airplanes flying in and around this or, you know, depending on the direction of the wind as well. What, what and why is it erupting? <laughs> well, we don't know, they say. Well, that's, that's a fair answer. Um, number of earthquakes increased recently between August and October. It said it's unclear. Dr. Jessica Johnson, a volcano geophysicist, University of East Anglia, said it's unclear why Mauna Loa has started erupting again. We speculate on it. Um, and I guess one of the carbon monoxide sensors was overloaded and shut down today because there was so much stuff. So has it erupted before? Oh yeah, it's erupted a lot. Um, and again, context, it's out in the middle of, of the Pacific. At some point we know a global phenomena of this stuff will be taking place according to scripture. That's what God says will happen during the tribulation. Uh, and with that, we're going to swing to Revelation 6, verse 6. And the focus here is hyperinflation. So for those of you who are new to the to this site, one of the things that takes place at the onset of the seven-year tribulation is hyperinflation. So we are constantly looking for trends that would indicate um, hyperinflation, where a day's wage is how much it's going to cost for people to eat. And that's effectively what Revelation 6.6 6 is saying. A quart of wheat for a denarius, which is a day's wage, three quarts of barley for a denarius, do not harm the oil and wine. And so effectively, a denarius, a day's wage, would, for a quart of wheat, three quarts of barley, that's how much it would take to make a, a loaf of bread or bread for a family. Now, obviously, plenty of things going on that would tell us that we are in a period of inflation. we got some things starting to roll back, uh, but it's not the end of it. Uh, it doesn't appear to be uh, settling for the moment, but at some point, inflation is going to take root again, and up things are going to go. Cost of living continues to go up. Uh, interest rates continuing to go up, but the focus here is the Dutch government. And the Dutch government is looking to purchase 3,000 farms and industrial polluters. Farmers are in the crosshair for environmental violations. The crime, ammonia and nitrogen oxide emissions exceed EU law. Now, this is a real person with a real title. Christian van der Waal is the nitrogen minister. So they have a nitrogen minister over there in, in the Netherlands. For agricultural entrepreneurs, there will be a stopping scheme that will be as attractive as possible. For industrial peak polluters, we will get to work with a tailor-made approach and in tightening permits. After a year, we will see if this has achieved enough. And again, this is from the nitrogen minister. And we're going to go to the Guardian. If you're interested in this article, click on this link. Give you an idea what it looks like. Uh, state attempts to push through plans to shut hundreds of farms to cut nitrogen oxide emissions. This is the Dutch prime minister. Uh, and it tells you what they're looking to do. Uh, the government, the nitrogen minister, <laughs> farmers would be offered more than 100% of the value of their farms to quit. I, this is just insanity. It's like, if we don't have farmers, we're not eating. Uh, I don't know if this has been realized or not. Drastically reduce emissions, transition to a new kind of business, extend in ways that reduce their impact, relocate, or voluntarily stop. Um, let's get down here a little further. This is the part that was, was scary to me because this, this is not even listed in the, the title of the article. The government's hand has been forced by a court case in 2019 that said the PAS melding, a kind of nitrogen futures trading scheme for farmers and industrial firms was illegal because it could not be shown that the development would not damage EU protected natural reserves known as Natura 2000. 
areas. The court ruling led to temporary building stop and 100 kilometer per hour limits on roads and made about 2,500 farms illegal at a stroke. Uh, Dutch building projects needed nitrogen permission, putting government plans to build 900,000 desperately needed homes, wind farms, and vital infrastructure at a standstill. So this thing's tied up in the courts. In the country, now this is, these people believe the country must reduce the number of pigs and chickens by 50% and graze cows on grass. Um, and they're just, they're just been out of shape. New figures show that animal numbers have remained more or less the same in the last decade with more than five times as many farmed animals in the Netherlands as it's 17.8 million people. Well, what are these people going to eat if all these animals disappear? I just, okay. Um, you can read the, the details on this if, again guardian.com it's in the environment section um wanting to take that out and so you know my first thought is and i had no idea this blew me away so what's the big deal well three thousand farms is a big deal and it did strike me you know the netherlands is a is a pretty small country i thought it might affect them locally within the netherlands and it will but what I didn't know is the Netherlands is the second largest food exporter in the world behind only the United States. Agriculture is over a 100 billion euro business. It's a big deal. And um, I found this article from Dutch Review. This was from July earlier this year. Dutch agriculture industry is growing record year last year um germany's their biggest customer dutch innovations farming for the future uh, these are some neat pictures read 17 ideas that make the dutch sustainability superheroes they're really serious about this growing bananas in greenhouses in the netherlands using food waste to feed farm animals 90 tons of animal feed a year entirely from human food waste so it's you know shucks of corn things that get um, byproducts of our food go to feed animals floating farm in rotterdam they're they're into it uh, and they touch on agriculture and the climate I'm not going to go there but anyhow, they're, they're making a thoughtful effort to be responsible and productive. And we're going to cut out 3,000 of these farmers because of too much nitrogen emissions. And as a friendly reminder, the composition of the air we breathe in our atmosphere is roughly 79% nitrogen. Okay. <laughs> it's like we got I mean, that's pretty much what we breathe. It's not bad for us. But yet, the EU has decided it's a problem. And they're looking to ban farmers. Going to buy them out. And with that, we will move to uh, Revelation 13, verses 16 and 17. And the second beast required all people, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of its name. Now, you know, again, I don't think we're even in the tribulation yet. I don't think it started. I don't think the events of Revelation 6 that we discussed earlier have happened. Uh, we are seeing bits and pieces of hyperinflation in pockets of the globe. And I think the longer, you know, the, the war takes place, in Ukraine and affects, affects their production of wheat that they export to mostly North Africa, parts of the Middle East and parts of Europe, you know, food's going to take a hit there. Europe's going to take a hit with food, with what's going on with the farms in, in the Netherlands, but we're not at a, at a point of hyperinflation on a global scale when it comes to, to food. Um, and we don't have a system where we're all interconnected 
and there's like a one world currency. But don't kid yourself, momentum continues to build for a trackable one world currencies. And the goal with all these central bank digital currencies is to be able to to report and be accountable. And if you get into this digitally, everything will be traceable. There's just no doubt about it. And you can add Brazil and India to the growing list of nations embracing digital currencies. Now, the key takeaways from this article, this is from the article in Vestipedia.com. Again, click on this link if you want to read the details. It's a nice overview article, and we'll take a look at it briefly. Uh, Brazil legalized cryptocurrencies as a means of payment. Uh, India's central bank is testing its digital currency in different cities, the rupee. And digital currencies could be potential drivers of financial stability in emerging economies. And that's who's taking these on right now. We'll go to this article from Investopedia. Um, We'll take a look at in Brazil. Chamber of Deputies of Brazil legalized cryptocurrencies as a means of payment throughout the country. This bill does not make any cryptocurrencies legal tender in the country, but the bill will include digital currencies and air mileage programs and the definition of payment methods that are supervised by the central bank. So it's the central bank that's going to supervise the movement of digital currencies and air mileage programs. So if any of you folks want to redeem your miles down there in Brazil, oh no, you don't. Big Brother will be watching how you do that. Uh, Brazil has the most cryptocurrency ETFs in Latin America and most banks and brokers in the country. Cryptocurrency investments and similar services such as custom and token offerings are available. So they're very open to it. Uh, Skip to India, the digital rupee. Start testing its retail central bank digital currency, a CBDC. We've been talking about that here recently at Paul the Poke. Four cities, Mumbai, New Delhi. Uh, I'm going to mess those other two. Bengaluru and Bubabsanwar. According to the Reserve Bank of India, four banks will participate in the pilot. Four more sets to join later, issued in the same denominations that paper currencies and coins are currently listed. The e-rupee would carry the same attributes as physical cash and that it wouldn't earn interest. Let me restate that. The central bank said adding that it wouldn't earn interest and could not could be converted to other forms of money, including bank deposits. Interesting will be distributed via mobile wallets. Transactions between individuals and payments to merchants are both possible. Scanning a QR code would be required for the latter. That little QR code keeps showing up. It's a big deal in China. It's a big deal in Australia. Seems to be tied to a lot of activity. You have your own personal QR code, which Big Brother has access to it. You know, and clearly in places like uh, China, you know, if you have a red QR code, you may not participate in society. In fact, we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. You know, and even in Australia, if you uh, did not have your QR code that said you'd been vaccinated, you were not allowed to participate in society. So, I mean, we always already have hints of 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 a mark, if you will, Um now, granted, it says it's on their right hand or on their forehead. But you look about how many people go around carrying that, you know, their phone in their hands and uh, mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Um, QR code, that's your ticket to society. And with that, you know, we're talking briefly about China. We're going to jump into China. Revelation 9, verse 16, and the number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. Now, there's only two possibilities for the size of an army. China and or India have have the number of people who are capable of having a, a an army this big. 
And I know that sounds over the top, but keep in mind, China currently has an estimated 300 million citizens quarantined and or in COVID camps. Uh, All kinds of protests taking place across China. Um, This one is not catching a lot of traction, and I get why it's not. Foxconn. For those of you who are not familiar with Foxconn, Foxconn is a place where Apple products are manufactured. It's this little commune where people live and work, and they're kind of fenced in and locked in. Uh, People who agreed to work at Foxconn discovered they were cheated, and they revolted. Good thing the Chinese white warriors, and you're going to see that in a second, were there to kick some sense into them. And Kyle Bass effectively is calling out Tim Cook and Apple. I wonder what the vacation policy looks like at Foxconn. Hashtag China. Hashtag slavery. Uh, This is from Jennifer Zing. Dozens of CCP police. China Communist Party. Police surround and kick a Foxconn worker during the latest iPhone City riots. Newly recruited workers found out they were cheating and wanted to go home. Oh, no, you don't. You will not go home. In fact, uh, this is how we're going to handle that situation. And this is just one of many different videos you know, go go to Twitter and go hashtag Foxconn, hashtag iPhone City Riots, and you can find all kinds of stuff like this. This is where your Apple phones, your Apple products come from, your iPhone. Now, here's Tim Cook over here, uh, and he quotes Martin Luther King, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Well, in this case, it looks like we're kicking them. Um, and that's the reality of it. These products are coming from sweatshops in China and there's plenty. I mean, these, these, uh, little villages at Foxconn piles of trash, six and eight feet high people throwing trash out their window. No, no public services. Um, communist Chinese police welding doors shut iron bars putting iron bars on apartments welding them shut to keep people in um not nice not nice how we treat our fellow man largest quarantine camp in china's guangzhou city is being built Ninety thousand isolation pods and by the way if you go to tiktok and look this stuff up. There are tens of thousands of videos on these little pod cities being set up. Isolation pods where they throw people in isolation because they've, quote, tested positive for COVID. Now, the Chinese government tells us that cases are spiking out of control throughout China, but yet only not very many people died, really. And with any of these, I don't see any hospitals being built. Now, I, I may not know what a little hospital looks like in this grid, but I think that's a fair question. And this just goes on and on. These are double-decker COVID camps. I guess found out, you know, we could stack these too deep, get twice as many people locked up again over three estimates are close to 200 300 million people um, in quarantine are locked up in china and if they find out like one of these high rises here in the background has got a bunch of people with covid they will lock that whole thing down again weld steel bars keep people in not let them out something to think about um Great follow, Song Ping Unk, on uh, Twitter. Help, Chinese government simultaneously building hundreds of quarantine camps now. This one's for 48000 They can simply flip a switch to remotely turn your COVID passport to code red. 
then you need to do your time in quarantine camp and pay for it. So some of their, quote, political prisoners or political adversaries, they, they, they show up and test positive. And then, you know, the people in the white hazmat suits come after you. You try to enter a public place with a red QR code, an alarm goes off. Chinese government can easily cut you off from society by remotely switch your COVID passport to code red. Means you need to do your time in the quarantine camp and pay for it. Here's what it looks like that flashes red. They have green, yellow, and red, and they're even starting to arrest some people that are turning yellow, I'm seeing in some tweets. Um, and then part of the deal, too, I don't know if any of you had seen this. Um, Oh, Governor DeSantis in Florida had called out uh, Apple. Tucker Carlson had also on Fox News, but apparently uh, had cut off some of their communication with a, with a software app on their phone, trying to keep people from communicating, not letting people know this stuff was going on. It's a really bad look for Apple. And I mean, it, well, they're just ta- they're they're just taking advantage of uh, effectively making it slave labor. There's just no getting around it. So, and videos are getting out. Light is shining. People are paying attention. It's there for people to see. So, at any rate, that's been this last week of what's going on. Um, you know, and again, take all this stuff with a grain of salt. I encourage you to do your own homework. Um, I think we're trending hard toward the return of Christ. Um, you know, and if you look at the things that are described in the Bible leading up to his return from the prophets in the old Testament, from Jesus himself and from the book of revelation, we're, we're, we're trending in that direction and all the key players, the ancient names that correspond to the modern day countries. It's lining up. Are we close? I I think we are. Uh, But, you know, ultimately that's not for me to decide. God will decide that. Um, It doesn't appear to be sustainable before something big happens. Time will tell on that as well. Um, But we'll watch. God's patient, long-suffering. You know, what we think is a big deal may not be a big deal in the scheme of things, and we may have to watch a lot of stuff happen with a lot of suffering before it does actually start to happen according to the way he describes it. And just because we see bad conditions and people die does not mean that we're under the wrath of God. And I would challenge people to think about this. The church has been under pressure for coming up on 2000 years now, um, people have died for their beliefs. I suspect people are going to continue to die for what they believe in regards to Christ. But that does not mean they are under divine wrath. It means they are being persecuted by the world and or Satan. Doesn't mean they're under God's judgment doesn't make it any better for those individuals. I mean, death is still death. Punishment, or not punishment, but but pain, torture, um, mocking, whatever. The persecution is still persecution. Now, whether or not it's coming from the world or unbelievers or Satan, you know, that's one thing. Jesus died for that, died for our sins as well doesn't mean we have to go through that again, but at any rate. So appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to this. If you would, please feel free to share this with others at paulthepoke.com. If you are not a member and would like to become a member, it's free. Type in your email address here. Hit subscribe. We don't sell any of this information. At least that's what WordPress tells me. I've not had any complaints of anybody being on any uh, email list that I know about. Um Biggest thing I hear is cookies that get attached to this stuff. Like I look at a lot of investment stuff, so this is why this shows up on my my commercial feed. And, you know, somebody's going to attach commercials to this one way or another. Honda. 
my wife drives a Honda. <laughs> it's an old one. It's 2014. <clears throat> so, um, if you're seeing stuff you don't like on, on your commercial feed, you might want to check with what you're watching or with what somebody in your household is looking at when they're surfing on the internet. Also, I do have books available. Shameless plug. Um, in regards to end times scenarios, the gospel 33 AD takes a look at some of the feasts, the spring feasts specifically in the gospel 33 AD and how Christ fulfills prophetic scripture within the context of the feasts. Also take a look at the end times through the eyes of Gabriel, God's messenger. Click on these links below at Amazon. Um, Rapture, The Bride Redeemed, this first book I wrote, takes a look at the rapture, just the nuts and bolts of the rapture. A good friend of mine calls it rapture for dummies. I take that as a compliment. And then I take a look at the uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation up through chapter 3. Break it down verse by verse. Verse. What does it really say within the context of uh, you know the grammar that was written Uh, the cultural customs of the time. And that's the one thing that I have learned even more since writing that book is there are so many different perspectives that one can view revelation from a standpoint of music, poetry, history, uh, you know, Asia minor customs of the day, Roman customs of the day, Jewish customs of the day, and they all fit. It's unbelievable. It's amazing how, how well orchestrated and choreographed the book of revelation is absolutely mind blowing. Um, says what it says, says he's coming back. He comes back tomorrow. You know, what, what What would you say? Jesus drops in. How's it going? What would he think? What would you think? Anyhow, appreciate you guys following along. Hope you have a great evening. Take care. Bye.